Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for um, the honor of having you uh, here with us uh, today. It's been um, uh, an, a tremendous uh, opportunity for us to interact with uh, um, the patient groups that we treat in the area and beyond. It's a tremendous opportunity also to get to know, for me at least, the um, people in the myeloma crowd. Um, and I thank them profoundly for uh, the honor of having me here. Um, and what I would like to do, it's late in the afternoon. We've had lunch. And you know, um, it's, I don't want to uh, torture you with data and too much detail. But I, I want to give just an idea uh, of what we may be talking about in the myeloma crowd 2030. So areas of interest and areas of focus that are mostly um, dealt with or researched now in our laboratories and may become viable myeloma treatments in the medium term. And if you, I, would, I was very impressed, and actually I thought that was a wonderful slide that uh, my colleague, Dr. Ajay, showed detailing the process of bringing an idea or a promising concept from the lab all the way to the pharmacy shelf. And as we all saw, that takes many years. So what I would like to do today is tell you what may be in the left part of that diagram uh, some ideas that uh, may actually um, lead to better responses, longer responses, and even the C word cure down the line. So we all know just a couple of introductory slides. We all know that um, uh, with the advent of novel agents, uh, proteasome inhibitors and um, uh, thalidomide analogs in the early 2000s, our patients live longer, and we see uh, fewer deaths per year for myeloma. And this is attributable to the am amazing uh, progress in bringing myeloma drugs uh, to um, the clinic, starting from the early 2000s, bortezomib, lenalidomide, thalidomide was the original drug that ushered in a new era, down to Selinexor uh, a few months ago, and a new anti-CD38 uh, anti antibody only a couple of days ago. And what we're dealing with, you know, I've been alluding to this. This is a slide that um, I made with an artist back in Wisconsin to kind of start the conversation with our patients. So the, the immune system is like an army. And like an army, not everybody is doing the same job. There is the Pentagon, there are the troops on the ground, and they're the snipers. And when I met some of you back in uh, October, I mentioned that, you know, when I was bringing this analogy in Wisconsin, everybody was going, mm hmm. So I was like, I'm not sure in California how this, you know, <laughs> gun analogy would. So there is a little bit of a cultural uh, uh, thing there. But basically, actually, it's, uh, it's quite accurate because plasma cells, like snipers, they don't roam they stay put in the bone marrow, and they should. And the bullets of the immune system we call antibodies. And normally, the bullets are supposed to do what, you know, a situation in an army would do, take out the invaders. But what happens in myeloma is that the snipers go rogue. First of all, you have too many of them, and they are crazy. <laughs> they are crazy even before they got the dexamethasone. So, so they shoot aimlessly. And when we have aimless bullets, what do you have? Collateral damage. So basically, that's why when we see kidney damage in this disease, initially the patient who's first you know, faced with this new reality, they're like, well, I mean, my kidneys, they're far away from the bone marrow. What's happening with the kidneys? It's because all these bullet and bullet fragments, eventually they will circulate in blood, and blood is filtered through the kidneys, and they will damage the kidney. But also what happens is that the rogue um, snipers, they uh, 
acquire new tastes and they acquire a taste for the bone that normal snipers don't really care about the bone. They just want to stay, you know, like nicely kind of sheltered. But those rogue snipers, they start chewing on the bone and they spit out calcium, which is often what, what, what the bones are made of. You know, bone is like marble. So uh, that's why we find a lot of our patients coming to us with high calcium levels. And of course, if you have the thugs in the bone marrow, they will take the food from the good workers because the production line of your blood is in the bone marrow. That's where blood is put together. What flows in your veins is the finished product. So there's only so much space in the bone marrow, and uh, it's like business class. And so basically, <laughs> you know, they, the myeloma cells are pushing out, you know, no, nobody gets upgraded. So, um, so uh, okay, so this is the drugs that Ajay did a wonderful job going through the drugs. But the point that I want to get across is this, that we do not have approved targeted therapies. And by that, I, I am alluding to the question that was raised before. Like, do you have drugs that address the genetic makeup on each and every myeloma uh, tumor. And we don't have, the closest we get to that is the situation with venetoclax that some of my colleagues mentioned before, where we have a drug that benefits a subgroup of patients with a specific molecular abnormality, which is in this case is 1114. So it means that if you have 1114, you are likely to respond to that drug. But that's not generally the concept of how we treat myeloma. The way we treat myeloma, what I tell my graduate students in the lab, is a, it's a concept, I'm going to scare you with a scientific terminology. And I'll tell you in plain English what it means. Or in plain Greek. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm a bit animated. We're from the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> so um, basically, the concept is called synthetic lethality, which means that the myeloma cells are teetering on the brink of something. They make too much antibody. And if you just upset them a little bit in the mechanism that they use to make this excessive bullet, they will say, you know what? You know, life is not worth living. If I cannot make my antibody, I'd rather die. And that's what proteasome inhibitors, for example, do. They interfere with the ability of the myeloma cell to process all the protein, all the antibody that it's trying to process. Um, but we really do not have many therapies that address the genetic makeup of the myeloma cell, and we need to move in that direction. So the way we see this from the lab point of view, and that gives me the opportunity to say that mouse patients with myeloma are very similar to human patients, but there is one major difference, that the family couldn't care less. <laughs> in the cage, there is, no, there is no social support. The patient is by, basically left to their own device. It's, it's an ugly world out there <laughs> in the mouse world. But basically, what I think that we need, and that's what, when I teach my, my graduate students, I say, we got to focus on these unmet needs. Um, one is this targeted therapy. So you treat the patient with uh, a drug that, they, that corresponds to the genetic makeup of their tumor. The second uh, issue is something that Dr. Chari uh, brought up before, that we, our patients are living longer, we have more drugs, and now we see myeloma in other areas that normally, in the old days, we wouldn't expect to see it. So myeloma, when we teach our medical students, we say it's a bone marrow-based disease. But as a lot of you know, we can find myeloma anywhere in the body, including in the brain area, which is a very unusual presentation of myeloma, but becoming more and more something that we ha have to deal with. We'll um, allude to this in a second, a little bit more, and tell you what we think um, we could do about this in terms of uh, uh, creating new research directions. And the last part is that the myeloma cells are not 
sitting there in vacuum. They are surrounded by other cells, by immune cells, healthy immune cells, that somehow are inactivated and they don't want to do anything against. They are scared to submission by the power and might of the myeloma cell. And in fact, the whole thing is encased in what we call the matrix, right? Which is the goo that surrounds everything. These uh, cells do not interact in thin air. In the bone marrow, you have inert parts where everything comes together. And it turns out, nobody would think so a few years ago, perhaps, but this inert matrix is actually part of what makes the myeloma behave as myeloma. So going back to these mutations, we talked about the translocations, but when people analyze, this is from the, um, uh, uh, my, from the broad Harvard group, the genetic makeup of myeloma, they found that the major nasty player called RAS, it's a gene that controls the growth of a cell. And when that gene becomes mutated, essentially, it's like pushing the accelerator all the way and not letting go. So myeloma cell, the myeloma cell gets a signal, gets a encouragement to continue growing and growing and growing. The size of, so these are different genes, names of genes, and the size reflects the abundance or the, pre the prevalence of, the, each, of mutations in these genes across our myeloma patients. And you can see that RAS is a major player, but guess what? We do not have um, appropriate models where we can study this disease. And trials of uh, agents that um, would intercept this pathway have not really been very successful, which means that although the problem is there, we don't necessarily know how to best address it. So one of the major uh, focus of research in my lab is that we created the first RAS-driven myeloma model, and this is now under review in a journal called Blood that some of you may be familiar with, but we hope that we will have now a mouse that reflects myeloma as it presents in about 50% of our patients at diagnosis. In fact, we find this pathway called the RAS pathway to be even more prevalent when patients come back to us with relapsed disease and very prevalent in these patients where we have this extra medullary disease. So disease that's outside the bone marrow in other parts where it shouldn't be. So for the first time, we now have a living system where we can try new therapies and really try to move the field forward. Again, you know, this concept of extra medullary disease, we really need to deal with this problem. Myeloma uh, classically will grow inside the bone. In this patient, this is a PET scan, that's her thigh. You can see that there is a myeloma uh, lesion top right over there in the, so in the muscle. So from, from the research point of view in the lab, we have to stand back and think, is the myeloma in the bone similar to myeloma outside of bone? So we probably need two different strategies or more than two different strategies to really deal with myeloma popping up in non-traditional areas, if you want. So that's a big problem and that's becoming more and more of an issue. Okay, this is the, uh, so I will give credits to our colleague, Dr. Morgan, for this figure. Um, this is what we talked about before. Um, the, you see the progression of myeloma from MGAS all the way to treatment and relapse. Um, clonal heterogeneity reflects to the branches. Your treatment may actually prune one branch, leave another branch behind, and in fact, relapse sometimes uh, grows from either small branches that you didn't appreciate before or new growth. So it's a very complicated uh, picture. But I think that this analogy is very uh, useful for us to understand that the impact of therapy may not be the same on all our branches. And we really need to start thinking 
of each and every patient as a complex microenvironment or microcosm, if you want, of myeloma cells that have to live next to each other and are affected by therapy in different ways. So it's not simple. It's getting more complicated. Okay, and the last thing um, is this concept of what's around the myeloma cell. So this is from uh, a very high-profile review in a very high-profile journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, from two very high-profile uh, people in the myeloma field, Drs. Palumbo and Anderson. This basically dates back to 2011, and it shows you the fried egg, your myeloma cell over there, in cohabitation in the bone with cells that make part of the bone. It's these cells, osteoclasts and osteoblasts and cells that are part of the matrix, um, top right, bone marrow stromal cell, or produce matrix. However, we now know that the situation is actually quite more complicated, and in addition to the cell types that we mentioned before, you have a number of different players that form part of the um, healthy immune system. In fact, even if you look into the healthy immune system, you will see that there are some characters there that are more menacing than others. So the myeloma cell has the ability, maybe through increased salaries or other benefits, <laughs> to actually co-opt some of the normal immune cells to serve the new master. So you would think that the normal part of the immune system is still recognizing the myeloma as foreign and tries to eradicate it. And you think that there is a battle between good and evil. That is true, and that is part of the story. However, there is part of the immune system here to the right that switched sides, used to be part of the entities that uh, are after the myeloma cell and want to control the myeloma cell, but, you know, I don't know, the myeloma cells, we talk them into actually serving the new master. So a big part of our research is both in the lab and clinical is to how to convince these entities to the right to actually remember what they were there for <laughs> and uh, go after the myeloma cell. So I want, well, you know, I'll, I'll just give you two, a, a very, in two slides, I'm, I'm going to skip over a lot of slides because um, it's late, but um, in my laboratory and moving this to clinic, we found that uh, the goo around the myeloma cells in the bone marrow also matters after transplant. Turns out that if you have a lot of a component that we call versican, look at the high, you know, we stain it red. Um, look at the top right uh, uh, graph there. So this is a bone marrow after transplant, 90 days after transplant. For patients that are high in this particular component, these patients are the patients on the green line there, and these are your typical survival curves, that unfortunately will not do as well after transplant whereas patients who are negative will do pretty well after transplant. And now we're trying to understand why this is and what we can do about it. The take-home message, though, is you thought that the goo was irrelevant, that it's just basically nothing. Well, it turns out that we, are not, we don't have just to think about the tumor cells, but we have to think about what's around them. And I'm, I'm pretty much done. I don't want to... Um, bore you with all of this, but you know, okay, the acknowledgement slide. So first of all, I want to say she's not on here because that's my lab acknowledgement slide, but I'm very grateful to Dr. Costello um, because um, I was brought into this amazing institution and, you know, being um, part of her team and being mentored by her has been wonderful. And um, a, a number of people in my lab, particularly Thanos, my graduate student, who was brave enough to cross the Rocky Mountains, uh, you know, and come over to the West with me. Um, so I had my 
uh, lab at UW-Madison, a wonderful institution before I came here. And I would like to thank our uh, funding agencies and all of you for your attention. Thank you.